Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren. En de Bali is zo'n plek. Bienvenue, een very warm welcome. Hartelijk welkom iedereen. Mijn naam is Juri Albrecht, ik ben directeur van de Bali. And I'm going to continue in English. We're going to have this afternoon in English. Um, a very warm welcome, like I said, to everybody. It's a very um, special afternoon, I have to say, also for me personally. Um, it's a common endeavor between Octavo and the Institut Francais and the Bali. Um, but that's not um, uh, so important because we always work together with all sorts of institutes. It's uh, very important because it, this is an evening, uh, no, it's an afternoon with Etienne Balibar. And um, uh, the occasion is a book he made with uh, um, Hans Venema, and the book is dedicated to Graham Locke. And Graham Locke is one of my old professors in Leiden and in Oxford. He passed away. Um, he should have been uh, 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 cooperating on the book. And for me, it's a very personal um, uh, afternoon in that respect, because um, uh, Graham Locke is one of my great teachers, and um, to honor him with his book and with the visit of uh, Etienne Balibar is very uh, dear to me, because he introduced me also to the philosophy of Etienne Balibar, which I think is a very inspiring uh, way of looking at um, the world and at institutions. Um, he um, has uh, written about uh, Europe and the European Union. I think um, it's very important critique he gives uh, to our institutions. It's very uh, important message he has. He thinks about it profoundly, and we ask two people to react to it more from a, uh, a practical point of view, Judith Sargentini and uh, Laon Jan Brinkhorst, Laon Jan Brinkhorst being one of my old professors in Leiden as well. So again, in that respect, I'm very happy uh, about this afternoon. Um, I'd like to introduce to you and give the word to uh, Caterina Di Fazio, who is going to chair this uh, afternoon. I'm very happy that you're here. I'm very happy that you're willing to do that. She's one of the founders of Agora, uh, among many things, and um, she uh, uh, um, is a specialist in Etienne Balibar's philosophy. So I'm very happy that you're here, and I'm going to give you the floor, uh, and uh, I hope you enjoy yourselves. Thank you all, dear ladies and gentlemen. So a very warm welcome to the Bali. My name, as reminded already, is Caterina Di Fazio. I'm working at Maastricht University Studio Europa, and I'm also the co-founder, as reminded already, of Agora Europe, together with Nadia Urbinati and our special guest here today, who is uh, Professor Etienne Balibar. Etienne Balibar is Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at the University of Paris West Nanterre, and also affiliated with the Faculty of French at Columbia University, where we actually have met in New York, and Kingston College in London. He published on the foundations of political philosophy, including Spinoza, Marx, and world famous work, Race, Nation, Class, in 1988, together with Emmanuel Wallerstein and La Proposition de la Liberté, pardon, uh, 2010. In the past years, he dedicated many of his works to Europe, and this is why we're here today. Uh, so the Bali invited Balibar already for many years, and we're very happy today to have uh, the, the occasion to be able to speak with him on his visions of the construction of the European uh, Union and the future of Europe, most of all. This afternoon, we will speak with Etienne about his visions and about the current state of democracy in Europe, and with his imagining the future for Europe, Europe, our fragile continent right now. With European elections approaching, where xenophobic parties are trying to form a transnational front for the first time and Brexit is creating a stalemate, it is becoming increasingly clear that the European project is in political and moral deadlock. So Etienne is going to help us finding solutions for that. Uh, he will start from his vision and especially he will give us a bit of uh, ways to know how to get forward. 
So after his short keynote, we will speak with two outstanding guests who will join us on stage afterwards and will reflect on Bolivar's proposition. We also gave, gave their, um, their ideas. So we were really happy to uh, welcome on stage afterwards former minister, former MEP and former EU ambassador, Lawrence Jan Brinkhorst, and MEP for the Green, Judith Sargentini as well. I will introduce a, li a little bit more of them afterwards when we're gonna have our discussion. Uh, as already uh, remembered, uh, today we're here to present uh, the book and uh, uh, Dutch Translation for and Under Europa in English for Another Europe. So Hans Venema and publisher Octavo worked together on this Dutch translation and uh, the book is actually going to be on sale so you're going to find it at the exit. Uh, the book is dedicated uh, to the late Graham Locke and as reminded already, was, uh, Graham Locke was a professor in Oxford University and also the coordinator of the Leiden Oxford Programme for the Study of European Affairs. So he was him to introduce Balibar to Hans Venema and this was the start of a joint effort to work on Europe. So we owe to Graham Locke to be here today possibly. So this program is made possible in cooperation with Institut Francais and Dutch publisher Octavo. And right now, I would like to invite Etienne Balibar to take the stage, please, and give us his keynote lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. Would you accept if I speak from here rather than uh, the lectern? Is that possible? Because I have some scattered notes, you know, and. And as a, an old professor, I, I should have become accustomed. Okay, thank you so much. Why am I the only one sitting here? That's, yes, please. You're the moderator. Thank you. You need to be here with me. <laughs> to moderate you. To moderate me, yes. <laughs> How much time do you give me? Oh. You have to That's be the sure. First I'm point. Gonna, can I lie? I give you 15 minutes. You give me 15 <laughs> minutes. Okay. That's hard. <laughs> and you cut me after 20. You actually have 25, but I shouldn't say that. Okay, okay. So no, no, because she knows me. You know, she's been <laughs> in my classes before, and it's uh, perilous. Okay, let's not waste time. First thing I want to say is I'm absolutely delighted and honored to be here tonight with you all. I thank you so much for coming. I was asked if I would allow people to come late, but I don't see where they would sit. <laughs> so that's probably not going to be the case. Um, on the other hand, you're free to leave whenever you like if you find me uh, boring. I, I was just telling <laughs> this silly uh, 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 anecdote. Um, uh, whenever I speak before an audience like that, if a few people leave, that's okay. Uh, if everybody starts to leave progressively during the talk, it's getting really awful. You think you are doing the worst presentation of your life, and then you wake up and it's just a nightmare. In fact, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, okay, thank you. A number of uh, things I would, like not only have to to do, but uh, that I want to make. Many people have been already mentioned. Allow me to again go very quickly through the list of people um, to whom I owe, in fact, this possibility of discussing uh, uh, tonight. Because Yuli of the Bali, uh, Yuri of the Bali, uh, has mentioned the name of uh, uh, my extremely dear friend. Uh, and Hans Venema's dear friend, Graham Locke. I will add one thing, uh, which is uh, I had met Graham a long time before that, or in the sense when we were only already students, he was a little younger than me. But the moment when I really became friends and deeply acquainted with him was in Leiden in 1976. And this, uh, I have to say, um, was uh, a, a joint, uh, a moment of joint work and friendship with another uh, uh, person who happens to be here tonight as well, my great friend Hermann von Hunsteren, and I thank him so much because at the time he was really the one who introduced me to the um, customs and uh, duties and privileges of working in a Dutch university. And then together with Graham, he became my promoter when I 
took my uh, PhD um, in uh, Nijmegen for other uh, reasons. So um, you see, I have a kind of past history in this country and particularly uh, the uh, academic places and uh, it's certainly one of the things which makes it so, f so important for me to be here tonight. Then I want to thank the Institut Francais, Hélène Dou, Anne-Marine Epker, Pascal Villa, uh, and uh, uh, I want to thank, of course, uh, uh, more than uh, anything else, Edis, uh, pa uh, publisher or Edition Octavo and Solange de Bourg, who wanted this book to be published in her uh, series and he, by her uh, um, uh, editorial board. Then come the translators. As one of them already mentioned is much more than a translator, although he, of course, did the main part of that translation. This is Hans Fenema, whom I also met uh, in those years in, uh, in Leiden, has remained a lifelong uh, 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 friend, interlocutor. Um, I wish he'd take part in the um, uh, discussion uh, tonight, but we have to limit ourselves. Other two people participated in the translation, Nele Isabat and Walter van der Star, and then my dear Caterina Di Fazio, who has created uh, Agora uh, Europe. This has been already mentioned. I just want to add two things to what has been said. I think this is a very interesting project launched and um, uh, supported and, uh, and, uh, and carried forward by uh, academics, uh, some of them very young from different European countries. The initial idea came from the uh, Portuguese uh, um, philosopher Rui Tavares, uh, uh, Caterina Di Fazio, Nadia Urbinati, uh, the great political theorist from uh, uh, Italy. I was honored to be associated with that. The project uh, now f focuses or centers on the writing of a charter, which is also in a sense a kind of manifesto called Charter 2020, is that right? Yes, okay. Which will be uh, officially presented in Brussels in the European Parliament uh, two weeks from now or even less. 20th of March. Uh, 20th of March, okay. I won't be there for professional reasons, but I uh, will be, uh, of course, uh, uh, intellectually and, uh, and politically um, uh, with them. The project centers, I'm sure this will, I hope this will come back in the uh, uh, discussion, about the, uh, around the idea of um, formulating, putting together, um, systematically uh, uh, organizing um, a series of public goods uh, in the traditional sense uh, of the term in political philosophy, um, which uh, given the circumstances, I can't help uh, also hearing in the following manner to uh, try and ground and found again uh, the European project and the European Union around a series of essential public goods, which of course include civil, political and cultural rights, protection, against uh, uh, racial and religious discriminations uh, um, and avoiding the uh, development of uh, state of exception situations, then um, uh, promoting juridical, political, social and territorial equality, I'm sure we'll return to that as well, then uh, um, uh, increasing or defending democratic governance both or, or at the uh, local or national level and what I will call the federal level in a minute. Um, of course, insisting on the importance for the European construction of environmental preservation and environmental justice with its social dimensions as well. And finally, or, or uh, before, uh, because I, I need to stop uh, enumerating uh, uh, freedom of circulation within and across uh, 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 borders, even if this is uh, something problematic for many European citizens and developing the idea of, of hospitality. 
all these uh, public uh, goods, in one sense or another, resonate in my uh, mind as the exact antithesis of another way of understanding the defense and the promotion of the European project, which focuses on the existence of certain public enemies. And, and <laughs> perhaps we will come to that uh, uh, later. And finally, what I have to say, but I've already uh, taken a lot of time, subtract it from my uh, <laughs> talk proper, is that I'm unbelievably uh, uh, honored uh, to uh, have been offered the possibility to discuss, to have a conversation with these two eminent, oh, they are no longer on the, <laughs> on the screen, <laughs> eminent uh, uh, personalities who know uh, a thousand more times than me uh, uh, about uh, uh, the issues we are going to discuss because they spent so much of their uh, active uh, uh, career. Um, dealing with uh, European affairs politically and intellectually. I mean, Professor Brinkhorst and members of the European Parliament, Judith uh, Sargentini. Okay, so um, now 15 minutes, you said. Okay. <laughs> um, the, um, the book that uh, is now translated into Dutch was written, in fact, already uh, um, was written. It was written over a long period because it's a collection of essays. Therefore, it's a work in uh, progress, combining, I would say, reflections and uh, uh, even positions that I thought I needed to uh, adopt with respect of uh, two uh, uh, current uh, uh, situations and uh, sometimes dramatic situations taking place in uh, uh, Europe. It begins in particular with a talk I gave in Athens uh, uh, in uh, um, uh, 2010, I believe, when uh, the consequences uh, uh, for Greece and also other political uh, European countries, but especially uh, uh, Greece, of the uh, uh, economic crisis of 2008 and the way it was handled by uh, European uh, um, uh, authorities began to, 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 be go to become an enormous uh, uh, problem. And it continues with reflections on other issues, particularly the questions of migrations and, and, and refugees, but not only, and uh, also more theoretical uh, uh, reflections of the kind that I will try to su summarize uh, uh, tonight in a, a minute. So this is a work in progress, and perhaps in some sense, even if it has been uh, 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 supplemented, I would, uh, I would say, or completed for the uh, Dutch uh, uh, edition by a couple of more uh, uh, recent interventions, it's uh, um, uh, certainly uh, um, uh, has the, uh, the, the risk and the, the, there's a, pos a possibility that uh, it's, it's already, to a large extent, out, outdated. On the other hand, um, if you look at it or if you hear about it, you'll see that I'm stubbornly returning, I would say, to the same unresolved uh, uh, question which I uh, would also, in more philosophical jargon, call the eporias or the uh, unresolved uh, problems of the European construction. And of course, what I find important is to try and explain how they affect our current situation, which lines of resistance, of innovation, of imagination they could also suggest. And uh, uh, to this I would uh, also add, of course, we have no other, other choice. Many people say that uh, today, but I completely agree with that. We have no other future than a European future each and every of us, individually, collectively, nationally, uh, and uh, uh, in that sense, there is no line of escape. So the important question is whether there, is also, there are also lines of uh, hope and uh, progress. Second thing I want to say very quickly uh, um, uh, at the beginning is uh, I write and I speak as a European citizen. This is, of course, I have my uh, nationality uh, card in, uh, somewhere in my uh, uh, pocket. I was born in France. I have French citizenship, uh, and I have worked in France, but not only in France. Uh, uh, um, 
but I really uh, try, and uh, I hope this is possible, to speak as a citizen, uh, as a European citizen, a citizen in Europe, uh, not only as a, a member of, uh, as a citizen of one member uh, 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 state. Uh, what does that mean? That means first that I feel uh, um, uh, directly and deeply concerned about uh, um, common problems, common issues. Some of them are local, other are global. They regard uh, uh, the planet itself and about specific national or regional issues, and particularly border issues between our countries, which affect deeply some of us, but in fact, all of us. And if I had time, I would take examples. I already mentioned Greece. I could mention Spain, the fact that there was a constitutional crisis in Spain, which is not finished, in fact, we have a trial going uh, uh, on, where uh, uh, some, uh, I, I'm not taking sides, I, I'm not saying I'm for the Catalan independence or against uh, uh, it, I just want to uh, 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 mention that uh, um, in that case, uh, some of us could have hoped for a kind of European mediation, particularly to make sure that the most uh, uh, typical and central democratic values were completely respected in handling that internal problem, which in my opinion was not exactly the case. So every European citizen should uh, have a say on that and uh, possibility of intervention, even if the forms are of course very uh, uh, delicate. Uh, I could mention Calais, the situation at the uh, French-British uh, 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 border, which will change uh, uh, its uh, juridical status perhaps if Brexit eventually takes place in which uh, it in whichever form something I'm still not completely sure of but uh, that's a matter of relatively subjective uh, interpretation but in any case the fact that the juridical uh, uh, status of that border is changed will not basically change the dramatic uh, uh, situation taking place uh, there which is very typical of the way in which rights of migrants and uh, uh, refugees are grossly uh, um, uh, um, mis mis mistreated and mishandled uh, within Europe uh, 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 today. And I could continue and say something, of, of course, we should say much more uh, uh, um, uh, about um, uh, um, the, the, the state in which the rule of law finds itself today in some uh, uh, Eastern European countries, independence of justice, freedom of press, uh, uh, and so on. Now this uh, leads to the idea that a European citizen like you and me and uh, uh, others uh, as well uh, uh, has a kind of uh, 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 right not only to observe um, uh, uh, the neighbor, the affairs of their neighbors, but to intervene in these affairs, and of course, conversely, to have his or her neighbors intervene, intervene in uh, his own uh, uh, national uh, uh, affairs. Uh, to give just a, a quick example, I find it extraordinary that our French president has just published uh, uh, an open letter, which is very interesting, I do not deny that, and whose propositions should be taken very seriously, addressing the European citizens in uh, general. But a few weeks before that, uh, expressed uh, uh, anger and, uh, and, and even fury at the fact that uh, an Italian uh, uh, minister was uh, coming to France to uh, express solidarity with the social movement that is taking place in France now. And of course, by the same token, trying to push or to pull, as you prefer, that movement in the direction that he would uh, uh, prefer. Now, again, I entirely admit that this is not a simple uh, 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 issue. Uh, course. There are forms of civility and perhaps also juridical forms that have to be carefully protected. But the fact that European citizens uh, uh, not only 
feel concerned, but uh, feel a kind of duty and possibility to speak and express uh, uh, their positions in the other uh, uh, country is something that could contribute with care uh, uh, to the development of uh, the uh, dramatically uh, um, uh, absent, I would say, development of a European public uh, uh, sphere without uh, uh, which uh, there is, in fact, no possibility to uh, uh, create a European of its own uh, uh, citizens. Uh, finally, I want to say that I uh, uh, speak with a certain sense of urgency because, uh, or write or and, and discuss, with a sense of urgency because, to put it simply, in a, a world which uh, is becoming, uh, uh, it was already hazardous, but it's becoming, uh, uh, in a sense, more, because we see that many of its internal and collective structures are destabilized by globalization and threatened by the environmental catastrophe and its coming effects, among which there are, of course, demographic uh, uh, effects. Europe could be or should be a resource. It should be a capacity of intervention um, in uh, uh, many uh, 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 different uh, uh, ways, uh, provided uh, it had the moral, the uh, political, and the uh, uh, economic or material capacity to do that. Perhaps it has it virtually, but it finds itself under our, our eyes uh, increasingly plunged into a kind of disarray and I would say par pa pa paralysis. So the word crisis is being used permanently and uh, uh, there are many good spirits uh, around us. This is a tradition that could be traced back to Jean Monnet himself, and there are bright representatives of that idea today. For example, the Dutch philosopher Luc van Middelaar, who used to be, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 had an official position in the um, uh, European Council of Ministers, uh, who uh, 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 keep believing that the kind of permanent crisis of the uh, political uh, uh, functioning of the European Union is in fact a dialectical canning of uh, uh, reason, the very way through which it's becoming uh, uh, progressively transformed and uh, uh, in fact moving uh, into the more or less desirable uh, uh, condition of a, a more integrated kind of federal uh, uh, Europe. Now, um, I'm not so sure of that. Uh, and of course, this is a matter of discussion uh, uh, between us. Borrowing uh, uh, an expression that was used first by Gramsci, then uh, I took it, in fact, from Zygmunt Bauman, and I used it, and others are now using it. I'm uh, um, using the category of the interregnum, that is this, uh, the, the intermediary state, which is also a critical uh, state, where old uh, social forms, old uh, institutions, old ideas and ideals uh, uh, prove uh, uh, um, uh, less and less uh, uh, effective or, or acceptable, whereas new uh, forms, new institutions, new uh, um, uh, collective movements are still more or less, not only they are virtual, but they remain uh, um, invisible and uh, uh, enigmatic. And in this kind of situation, of course, you have a paralysis, paralysis and you have uh, uh, pathological phenomena as, uh, as, uh, as uh, um, Gramsci used to, to say, and I repeat in my, in my book. Now, I'm not deriving from their uh, uh, catastrophic uh, uh, provisions or, or prophecies, uh, such as uh, uh, the European Union could collapse. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, what Brexit and other phenomena, even the Greek case, seem to uh, demonstrate before our eyes is the fact that, in a sense, uh, uh, this... Uh, uh, 
um, uh, this uh, uh, this system is not cannot collapse because uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, possible in particular for its member uh, states to simply move uh, uh, out, uh, which uh, reminds me always of the, of an old Jewish Soviet joke, but the uh, Jewish Soviet jokes are somewhat <laughs> outdated uh, uh, today. It's the history of uh, uh, somebody called uh, Rabinovich who wants to emigrate from the Soviet Union uh, and therefore calls for a visa to emigrate to Israel. And then the official asks him, why do you want to leave our uh, 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 beautiful uh, 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 Soviet uh, um, uh, country and, and federation? And he says, you know, because the situation is getting worse, uh, I have two reasons for that, okay? What are they? Uh, can you tell me the, the first first? Uh, in, so because uh, uh, the situation is getting uh, uh, worse and worse uh, uh, every day, the economic situation is not good, the moral situation is also uh, uh, bad. And of course, as always, in such situations, the usual scapegoats, the Jews, will become the uh, target of collective uh, hatred and... Uh, and uh, 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 um, uh, uh, revenge. You could translate that today, of course, uh, substituting uh, migrants uh, or uh, Muslims or whatever to the uh, uh, to the Jews. And I don't want to stay there when uh, uh, this will uh, happen. But comrade, this is impossible. Our uh, uh, country or our federation is strong. It is not going to collapse. Uh, and then the guy says, "This is a, says this is precisely my second reason." So uh, 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 transpose that, which I admit is a little uh, far-fetched, but uh, to the current situation, you, you get to the idea that there are forms of crisis which could uh, last almost indefinitely. But uh, uh, as they last, of course, the problems uh, uh, remained uh, 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 unresolved. And when they uh, are unresolved, of course, their moral, social, and political consequences get worse and worse. Now, to finish this, which is a little too uh, um, uh, general and perhaps abstract, uh, with your permission, I would try. I would like to mention particularly three issues which I find uh, uh, especially important. I don't say they are the only ones, and uh, I uh, completely admit that each and every of them requires a much better and more precise analysis than what I'm going to do now. Uh, the first thing I want, the uh, first issue that I want to uh, mention. Is, is, is the articulation of the social problem and the national problem. Uh, my position is that, uh, in fact, uh, there is a complete uh, reciprocity or interaction and interdependency between the social question, the national question, and the democratic question in uh, uh, Europe. The states in which we live, um, which find themselves today increasingly uh, dis dismantled, if you like, in their uh, uh, social policies uh, by uh, through the effects of so-called neoliberal uh, uh, policies, which were in fact uh, uh, already virtually uh, uh, contained in the uh, definition that was adopted in Maastricht in 1992, putting the idea of unbiased and unrestricted competition, not only towards the outside, but also within the European uh, uh, itself, in the uh, uh, leading and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the hegemonic uh, 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 place. So these states, uh, call them social democratic or otherwise, were social states within the national boundaries or based on the uh, uh, identification, of course, of politics in the strong sense with national uh, 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 politics of different degrees and forms. Uh, the project that uh, was uh, um, uh, developed by uh, what is sometimes called the Great Commission, European Commission, or the great moment in the history of the European uh, 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 Commission, beginning with Mansholt and others, and culminating, in a sense, with uh, uh, the Delors uh, uh, Commission, was to 
very uh, strongly and strictly combine uh, the uh, emergence of the financial and monetary instruments of the common market, which became eventually the euro, with the creation of so something called social uh, Europe. Not socialist Europe, but social Europe. That is, a full development of social rights, protection for uh, 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 labor, and also, of course, unemployed uh, um, uh, uh, people, and politics against the, the extreme development of uh, uh, inequalities in the population at the European uh, uh, level. As you know, this was uh, abandoned and this was dropped, or this proved not to be possible in the form in which it had been uh, uh, imagined and uh, uh, argued for uh, at the European level at the time. And of course, what we observe today are the consequences of this complete unbalance between the uh, uh, financial and to some extent uh, uh, political level of European construction and its social dimension. I don't say that the national question and the development of nationalism in Europe entirely uh, derives from there. On the contrary, I believe that uh, 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 Europe and pro-European liberals or, or socialists, like me and others perhaps uh, here, have grossly uh, uh, underestimated the difficulty not to suppress, this is absurd, of course, this is meaningless, the national level of uh, uh, collective feeling and, uh, and, and community, uh, uh, com communitarian love, but to transform, of course, the national idea and the national community uh, uh, into something new that would be uh, uh, possible and effective in the global uh, uh, world of today. Nevertheless, the, the effect of underestimating the, the importance of that question and completely cutting it, officially at least, from the social uh, question and the democratic question has produced uh, 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 a situation uh, in which we find ourselves today. And at this point, I want to say that, of course, I understand that there is something like a choice, uh, an ideological, even a moral uh, choice for uh, some of us between a universalist or federalist uh, uh, discourse and position on one side and a nationalist or populist uh, uh, orientation on the other side. But I'm not, absolutely not convinced <coughs> that you can solve the problem just by explaining that the populists are the bad guys and nationalism is something of the past and federalism uh, uh, is something of the future. As a federalist myself, I believe that one of the central tasks of Europe today is to find a discourse and a program, so to speak, to uh, um, uh, uh, change the function of the nation while preserving something essential of it. And you won't do that if you uh, uh, ignore that uh, um, uh, the social question is intrinsically and intimately uh, uh, linked. The second and third, I will be uh, uh, quick because I need to leave uh, room for discussion, are the following. Second. I think that the invention of a new federalism in Europe, which I'm hoping and uh, trying to argue for, is uh, uh, not really helped, and I put it as brutally as I can because I hope that uh, 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 some people more versed than me in the working of the uh, uh, European institutions will contradict this, uh, uh, perhaps, or that we'll have a discussion, is not helped but is largely hindered or obstacled by the kind of federal uh, 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 institution that we have today in Europe. I'm tempted to say that we live in a kind of pseudo-federalism today in Europe. So uh, pseudo-federalism means that there is a federal level of power, there is a federal level of institutions, there is a federal level of interdependency, and this is much stronger than perhaps many European citizens imagine. It's even the case for the, U so the United Kingdom, as we observe today, a fortiori, of course, for any of us. We are permanently living uh, uh, with 
uh, uh, in relationship to uh, uh, federal European institutions. But these institutions, uh, uh, Court of Justice, uh, European Commission, uh, uh, European Parliament, uh, um, uh, European Central Bank, yeah, seem to have a very paradoxical uh, uh, effect taking together which is not to unite the European uh, uh, citizens, but to isolate uh, 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 them individually or uh, uh, country by uh, uh, country while subjecting them to common rules. And of course, this has a lot to do with the fact that the rule of the rules is the rule of uh, 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 unrestricted uh, 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 competition, which means that the emergence of common interest, public goods, and common programs is uh, apparently extremely difficult, if not impossible, even when uh, 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 well-meant and uh, uh, intentioned European politicians argue uh, 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 for it. So there is a kind of perverse effect of neutralization of the common dimension, the common public, uh, uh, the European public sphere, which uh, 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 confers, of course, uh, in the view of many European citizens, an increasingly authoritarian and undemocratic character to the central uh, 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 institutions of the uh, 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 federation. Probably uh, one of the key issues in this respect is the nexus, Habermas is right of that, of the uh, uh, question of taxation on one side and the question of representation on the other side. I hope that the discussion comes to that, but my personal position is we do not need less taxes at the European level. Perhaps we need more, provided they are, of course, used for uh, 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 projects which are really uh, uh, of common interest uh, uh, including, of course, uh, 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 developing cultural and technological uh, uh, collective uh, instruments, but also reducing inequalities among the uh, uh, European population. And we do not need the destruction or the suppression of the euro, as many of uh, uh, my leftist uh, uh, friends in France and other places uh, 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 explain day after day, and we'll hear more of that during the European, uh, uh, the campaign for the European uh, uh, election. This is a point of stark, of strong disagreement. I'm not on the side of those who believe that we will be better equipped to struggle against or to combat inequalities in Europe if we get rid of the euro. I'm on the contrary of the opinion that the suppression of the euro would make it more difficult because it would make uh, uh, the existence of a common budget and common policies, in fact, something impossible or impractical in the global uh, uh, situation of today. But that, of course, means that probably we need a different euro or we need a different management of the euro, and, that, and therefore, it means that we uh, uh, need uh, 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 to introduce very strong elements of democratization of the financial and monetary uh, 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 policies of Europe today. And finally, the very last word, I apologize for the length, is that um, the more, and there are many others, but it's the last one on, on which I want to uh, uh, conclude, is that the more I try and think about uh, 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 the uh, um, uh, innovative dimensions and, in a sense, uh, uh, unknown aspects of that European federation I'm uh, uh, advocating, which doesn't uh, destroy the nations, but finds new ways of integrating them into a common uh, project, the more I'm convinced that, as the classics of political theory, Max Weber and others, never tired of explaining, there is no government, there is no power, there is no political community without strong legitimacy. Now, what are the elements of legitimation and that create legitimacy for uh, 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 the European construction uh, uh, that we are talking about? Today, the uh, uh, stress, the emphasis is strongly, if not exclusively put uh, on so-called output le le legitimacy. That is, the, what uh, cr creates the legitimacy of the European Union in the eyes of its own citizen is because it's very successful. Uh, 
Uh, it's very successful, it's very efficient, it manages uh, all sorts of problems from uh, harmonization of uh, technical norms and juridical uh, uh, um, uh, uh, systems to uh, uh, confronting uh, um, uh, economic uh, effects of globalization or the question of migrations and, uh, and, and managing uh, uh, the borders of Europe in a very efficient manner. But increasingly, many of us are not convinced by that. Uh, they think that, uh, at the very best, this output legitimacy has become extremely uh, 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 problematic and even, in some cases, dubious. They turn themselves, therefore, and rightly so, towards another kind of legitimacy, also known cl cl classically, sometimes called now in the jargon of political theorists, input legitimacy as opposed to output legitimacy, but that in more uh, 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 customary and uh, unusual uh, uh, terms means that uh, uh, popular sovereignty is lacking very, uh, 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 is lacking terribly in the European construction, particularly because it's essentially a two-level uh, uh, system based on a two-level system of representation. And of course, we understand why. There is a European Parliament, but this European Parliament, and I hope that Ms. Sargentini will contradict me on that, but has, uh, it has a, a great number of uh, uh, official uh, uh, powers but very limited possibilities to actually control and held in check or discuss or bring before the public uh, 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 sphere and uh, uh, audience the, 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 the choices or the disputes uh, 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 over uh, uh, the decisions that are made either by uh, the European Council or by the uh, uh, European uh, um, uh, Commission. Reason why, I, I, I believe that we actually uh, uh, a need, uh, and there are projects for that, of course, of different uh, uh, kinds, the uh, 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 popular sovereignty to be raised to the higher uh, level. That is what I had in mind when I said a minute ago, we need more representation in particular at that level. But finally, I think that there's a third type of uh, uh, legitimacy that we should never forget. Uh, and since uh, some of you may know that I'm supposed to be a Nord Marxist and therefore a stubborn materialist, they might be surprised. But I, I would say this is the moral legitimacy. This is the moral legitimacy or the ideal uh, 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 legitimacy. Europe will not exist, it will not uh, represent uh, a value for the future in the eyes of its own uh, uh, citizens if they don't see Europe as a moral force and as carrying certain very important ideals at the global system. This is why, in particular, I find the crisis not of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, the border system, but of the capacity of European peoples and governments to manage and develop a policy of uh, hospitality with respect to refugees and migrants, so catastrophic, because this destroys the moral strength and meaning of the European construction. Chancellor Merkel probably was wrong in believing that she should take a unilateral decision in 2015 when she said we have to take the, 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 the refugee, because that helped so many of the other European uh, uh, governments explain that the Germans had made that decision and we are not uh, 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 involved in that. So we can either applaud verbally and in fact sabotage the, 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 the plan behind the doors, which is exactly what the French government did at the time, or explain that we are uh, uh, using the opposite uh, uh, lens to uh, examine the problem. But in fact, leaving aside this aspect, which is not, of course, unimportant, I do think that she was doing the right thing. She was doing the right thing not only for uh, Germany, but also for Europe in, in general, because Europe has the capacity to uh, wage hospitality and uh, manage this problem, at least for the, 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 the present. And if it doesn't do it, it destroys its moral legitimacy without which the others won't work. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Etienne, and thank you all. Um, I obviously had a couple of questions to ask you. The plan was to have your feedback on what you just said, but I'm afraid no, we're running out of time. You're just afraid. <laughs> you're just afraid. Thank you yeah. for not cutting yeah. me. Yeah, uh, thank you. Instead. So I would like to welcome on stage former uh, MEP Lawrence Jan uh, Brinkhurst and also uh, MEP Judith Sarg Sargentini. Um, so, Lawrence Brinkhurst, please join us. Thank you and welcome. <laughs> Yeah. Welcome and thanks for being here today. Uh, so Lawrence uh, Jan Brinkhurst uh, is a retired politician for the Central Liberal Party D66. Uh, he was a EU parliamentar parliamentarian uh, for them in, in the 90s and chairman in 1981. Uh, from 73 to 77, he was in charge of European affairs in the cabinet under the leadership of Prime Minister Dan L. I hope I pronounced this correctly. Well, more or less. Yeah. Sorry, you're going to do that better. <laughs> and from 87 to 94, he continued his service at the European Commission uh, as Director General for Environmental Affairs and Nuclear Safety. In 1994, he became a member of the European Parliament also and served there until 1999. Uh, he also had other positions in uh, the national government, in various national cabinets, most recently Minister of Agriculture and Economics, respectively, in 1999 and 2006. Uh, he also has you know, like a number, good number of professorships in Dutch universities. Uh, the last one in, from 2006, uh, he's extraordinary professor of international and European law and governance in Leiden University. And now, uh, MEP uh, Judith Sargentini, she's a EU, EU parliamentarian for the Dutch Green Left. Um, she's um, like in the last uh, few uh, months, well-known years actually, for her criticism of Orban's presidency and the Hungarian. Um, supposedly uh, dictatorial policies and reforms. In last September, she actually managed to have uh, the majority in the EU Parliament for a vote on the activation of Article 7 of the uh, European Treaty, which enables punitive me measures to be taken against Hungary. And she's also, among other professional activities, uh, does developmental aid and privacy legislation. So as I said before, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions, but I will just switch to uh, ask you, please, if you could give yeah. us a feedback of what, about what you just heard. Yeah. Maybe well, first, first, you. first of all, you. Thank, thank you very much indeed. And I, I'm very pleased to recognize in Professor Balibar, a fellow European citizen. I think that's perhaps a very important point also in this country, because unfortunately, the real debate about Europe is not taking place in this country. We talk about pulse fishing, we talk about the terrible things between KLM and Air France and the fact that the French are therefore uh, destroying Schiphol, but there is no real debate. And I think the key point, and I, I fundamentally agree, is that the crisis we are witnessing uh, is that we may become irrelevant. Uh, I think I do not believe that in a very short time in the, in the Dutch situation we will be in terrible shape, but the irrelevance of Europe is growing. And I think that is the geopolitical dimension which I would like to very much support. You didn't use the word geopolitics, but I think on the one hand, we are changing from a multilateral world to a multipolar world. Let me explain. Uh, the multilateral world of the 70 years which we have behind us was a world by and large run by the West, America and Europe, by and large by WTO rules, by the effort to have a climate change agreement on Paris uh, and by and large therefore uh, complementing uh, might and law. Might and law. Uh, I think we are moving very rapidly away from that situation. We see authoritarian regimes around us in multiplicity, multiplicity uh, the Russians, the Turks, the Chinese, but also uh, the abandonment of America, uh, of a world which they largely shaped. Uh, and so we're moving away uh, from a world based on rules on a world based on might. Uh, a friend of mine recently said, uh, the world around us is becoming carnivore, uh, and Europe is the only vegetarian lef left. And I think that's a very interesting sta statement. The carnivores are there to use their might. Mr. Trump is only uh, concerned about winning bilateral games because for the time being, America is still strong. But he has left totally this moral ground, and I very much agree with you on that. 
And Europe, as a result, because we have no mind, because we are vegetarians and we have not learned how to eat anymore uh, other than vegetarian food over the last 70 years, we are therefore left in a situation of becoming very much inward-looking. Uh, the, the biggest danger in Europe is provincialization. And the provincialization means, obviously, that countries within Europe, and that's the second point, the external one is becoming more dangerous, but the internal morality, I would never have believed when we started in the 50s that democracy, human rights, and the rule of law would become an issue. Uh, we have here the rapporteur on Hungary, so I'm not saying a lot about Hungary, but we have also Poland. We have within uh, the European, old European Union, a country like Poland, uh, like, like Italy, which is proud of becoming uh, anti-rule of law and very nationalistic. And I think the crisis, the real crisis, therefore, is that the moral, moral ground of Europe is losing, that we are not defending our virtues outside, uh, and against that, the crisis is uh, the urgency. So I'm on your side and not on that of middle eye. Uh, we can muddle through. We have been muddling through for the last 12, 10, 15 years after the European crisis, but uh, the muddling through is over. And either the European elections, which are becoming more important, and unfortunately we have a prime minister in this country which said the European elections are not very relevant. It shows that Mr. Rutte is doublespeak. In Zurich, he says, we need might, we need force. And of course, I agree on that. I believe we need more defense. Maybe we disagree with Green Left, but I'm not sure. But it's side in the Netherlands, he says, ah, but we don't think the European elections are very relevant. In, in fact, the European Commission should be depoliticized. And so the debate in this country is gone. Very rapidly, the three points you mentioned. Uh, I think, therefore, I agree very much on the issue of European citizens. Um, curiously enough, since the Treaty of Maastricht in 1992, the word European citizens appears. Uh, and it is now, in the Treaty of Lisbon, even more explicit. And in fact, in theory, the European dimension is strongly European citizen-oriented. Article 10, paragraph 1 of the Treaty of, Ro of, 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 of Lisbon says, uh, European Union is based on representative democracy. The European citizens are represented by the European Parliament, and the member states are represented by the European Council. So, in theory, things are right. The reality, of course, is quite different, and I think you made that clear also. And here I come to a point which maybe is also relevant for our discussion about the European Parliament. The big cleavage between Europe and the nation state has grown ever since the first direct elections in 1979. Until 79, we had the so-called dual mandate. A lot of my former French ministers who were in the Dutch cabinet had been European parliamentarians and been national parliamentarians. And the separation has uh, led to a situation where the European Parliament is seen as irrelevant in the national parliament, and the national parliament has no more knowledge about Europe. Uh, the knowledge in the European Parliament uh, about European affairs, of course, is, is quite considerable, but the Knowledge is refused by the national parliamentarians. I'm not, of course, judging about it in France, but in the Netherlands, it's very interesting that we never had a former prime minister going to the European Parliament. In Belgium, we had Mr. De Haane, we had Mr. Uh, we had Mr. Verhofstadt, who, started, who is now, for 10 years, after being 10 years member of Parliament, uh, prime minister, member of the European Parliament. In France, we had Mr. Rocard, and we have had Barnier, in other words, the knowledge about Europe in national parliaments is, 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 is getting lower. Of course, the ultimate is, of course, Brexit. In Britain, we have had systematically uh, 50 years of anti-European statements, and in that sense, the Brexit is a unique thing, and I agree we will not give up European Union and the internal market, but it is very specific that the national parliamentarians have become anti-European forces. Second point, um, uh, and there I, I somewhat disagree. I agree and disagree. Uh, you mentioned that the Europe of uh, 1992 uh, with the law and Mansfeld was solely concentrated or largely concentrated on restricted competition. I think that is a bit too far. It is true we created the euro and monetary integration and we didn't have the social economic integration at the European level. 
therefore we got the stability and growth pact. But the point is that there have been efforts in the past of creating a more social Europe. And that's why I now very much welcome the position of Monsieur Macron in his letter a few days ago. He pleads for something quite dramatic, namely social, uh, social law uh, and even minimum wages at a European level, but then, of course, different according to individual countries. This country, the Netherlands, will be a strong opponent to that, uh, unfortunately, uh, because the Dutch uh, are both priests and merchants, but as we know, merchants always win in the Netherlands. And so we think we should not pay any money for these damned Italians who are not reforming correctly, or those stupid French who are uh, spending too much on the state. Uh, I mean, I, I'm exaggerating. I'm too old to be nice to people. Uh, <laughs> so it will not happen very quickly, but I think uh, it should be done, including, of course, uh, development, uh, uh, environmental issues, climate change issues, and so on. And my final point um, is, of course, uh, whether or not uh, we now have pseudo-institutions. Maybe I'm, because of my European past and my still present, present European intention, uh, I, I, it's, it's dangerous to plead for a, a fundamental change of the institutions. We should add elements. We should build up, bottom-up. We have had been too long a top-down approach. There I agree, uh, but to, to suggest uh, that we should, for instance, change the independence of the euro and the European Central Bank, I would be hesitant. I think there should be more, more, more uh, explanations in the European Parliament and should be the dialogue with the ministers. What is needed is, I think, that we develop the bottom-up, therefore the citizenship dimension and the democratization, and there I think the European Parliament can be of great help because I'm still believing that if the European Parliament is not getting on, forces of nationalism will prevail. Thank you. <laughs> you did, Sargentini. I wanted to ask you for a feedback, of course, but also on what uh, Etienne was saying right before, on this idea of a pseudo-federalism, pseudo on the idea that um, the European institutions don't really allow for an actual uh, unified, on a political, social and economic level, um, yeah, for a unified Europe. So is, is, is it real that these institutions are actually weak? And I was thinking also about this definition that Orban gave of our democracies as being, especially in Hungary, and liberal democracy. So are those institutions weak to allow a liberal, like a, an actual federalism? And also at the same time, are they so weak that they can actually allow uh, a liberal democracy? Thank you. Okay, well, I, 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 I circle I circled the word pseudo-federalism on my, on my note. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me start with what I, I picked up. You said you would have liked to see or you would have expected Europe to do some mediation in the constitutional crisis in Spain. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think we all would have liked that. But it immediately leads to the question, whom then in Europe? What then in Europe? What is Europe in a mediation in the crisis in Spain? And when you spoke about pseudo-federalism, you gave a whole list of European institutions. But in that particular list, you did not list the Council of Ministers. And I think this is crucial. If I look at, I'm, so I'm, I'm coming to an end of a 10 year uh, term in the European Parliament. Uh, and when I started uh, in 2009, a couple of months uh, later, the Lisbon Treaty was put in place. So, uh, uh, December 1, 2009, the European Parliament actually got quite a lot of extra um, uh, power due to the Lisbon Treaty. And I ended up in the committee that dealt with asylum and migration um, legislation, and you could really see the difference before and after 2009. We are co-legislators on a lot of issues. What I think is, uh, what is the problem in the European uh, Union um, is the lack of political will and the fact that the Council of Ministers or ministers in the Council think they are not presenting, uh, they're only presenting their own national uh, needs. 
And now I'm not going to question whether that's democratic or not, because in the end it is. The ministers are there, backed by a national parliament that is elected by its citizens. And actually citizens in Europe have two ways to influence European politics through national elections. Their, uh, uh, their ministers in council and through European uh, parliamentary elections. So from, from one institution to the other, pointing at what is not democratic is not helpful. It has to do, I think, more with attitude, with morale and ethics. Uh, and those are lacking. I'll, I'll, I'll use the uh, Hungary example. Yes, I managed after eight years, I managed to get a vote through the European Parliament where I got two thirds majority on a report that says um, uh, that, we, that we see Hungary sliding down and, and it's officially called um, uh, a risk of a breach of the rule of law. Well, leave mm -hmm. out the risk because we're seeing a breach of the rule of law, but that's what officially it is. It has to be taken in now by council, and they're not. And why is that? Well, because when it was voted in September uh, 2018, we were working with the presidency in the council, which was Austrian, which is a government of FPÖ, which is the extreme right, and ÖVP, which is the European People's Party, the Christian Democrats. And they, close to Hungary as they are, physically, historically, but also, uh, but also politically, had, uh, had issues by uh, acting on it. And now we've, we've seen this taken over by the Romanian presidency, January 1 to July, uh, July 1, and the Romanian government is of a different political color. It's social democrat liberal, but they are on a similar track. And they simply don't, both of them, simply don't put forward a proposal for a real debate in council. And in council, there are those countries that really try to get a process going, and the Netherlands is one of them, for instance. But there are a lot of countries that are mem uh, prime ministers or ministers for foreign affairs that are hiding behind the ones that really don't want to make a move. Romania, Poland, Hungary itself, of course, the UK. They're still part of it, and the UK doesn't want anything here because... Viktor Orban supports the UK, supports Theresa May, uh, and he, she doesn't have a lot of support anymore. <laughs> so you see a different, yeah, and you see a different sort of um, politics within the council, which is rather short-sighted. Um, and I've got one other example there. We are going to install which is fantastic and it's been years of work, we're going to install a European public prosecutor who needs to deal with the misuse of European funds and criminal uh, and issues across border. And we might be able to build that out to something more because we're dealing with cross-border crime. Now, there are two possible candidates for that right now. And one of them is the lady that Miss Laura Kofeshi, uh, the lady that has been sacked by the Romanian government because she was so good as a national public prosecutor prosecuting uh, uh, corrupt, um, uh, co uh, co prosecuting corruption, that she became a problem for the government because she was going after ministers and politicians. So they threw her out. The European Parliament <laughs> has put her, put her on the number one list. The council didn't dare doing that. And I understand. I mean, they have to sit there with Romania as a precedent uh, uh, for that forum right now. But they didn't dare doing that. And we need to now seem to come together. I'm in the negotiating team for the parliament. But how do you negotiate tweet two people into one person? I, I still have to figure this out. But this is daily politics, where actually the parliament has quite a serious say, and I wouldn't go for the simplified, there is a, Europe, there is a democratic gap in Europe, because it's actually being closed, and it's being closed not only uh, by the Dublin Treaty and new institutional agreements, but it's being closed by trial and error. Um, but it, it is politics, as politics is everywhere. It can be very nasty. Um, final example, uh, Chair. Yesterday, the council said no to the blacklist of 
third countries that are a risk to our security, third countries that can be involved in money laundering or terrorist financing. It's a legislation I negotiated and I got the Council to agree on, and it's important for our own security, fighting money laundering and fighting terrorist financing. And the Council knew there was going to be a list with countries that are not keeping up to speed and not checking their, their banks properly. Uh, and that, that finally, after years, that list came. And it has Panama on it. I think that's a good idea. It has the, Amer the US Virgin Islands on it. It has Saudi Arabia on it. And 28 out of 28 member states yesterday said, we don't want this list because, well, we are not clear how this list came about. But they're actually saying it is too political difficult for us yeah. to explain to Saudi Arabia that we think their legislation on, on fighting money laundering is not up to scratch. It's, I think our pseudo-federalism is in the fact that the council is not transparent and they're bringing their, of course, and I'm not blaming that, that they're bringing their own needs, but they're also very much afraid to tell each other the truth. We could have acted on Hungary in 2010 when they started to change the constitution in a couple of weeks' time. In fact, I've got a colleague in the European Parliament from the Hungarian European People's Party, Fidesz, who is proud to say he has rewritten the constitution on his iPad, on his weekly flights, Budapest, Brussels, Brussels, Budapest. But we watched, looked away and we said, we made it an institutional issue, we said, it's the European Commission that is the guardian of the treaties, and we can always go to Luxembourg to the European Court, and they will go to court against Hungary, and therefore we don't have to get involved politically. Yeah. Europe is politics, and we can change the institutions, but if you don't change the political will, if you have a prime minister, and I, 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 I quote you there, La La Ancian, if we have a prime minister that says po uh, the European elections are not important, you're actually creating an atmosphere yeah. in your country that says nothing to expect there, and you also will not hold me accountable, and you yeah. need to hold me accountable because I'm an elected politician, and you will not hold yeah. your own yeah. ministers accountable when they come back yeah. from council meetings. Yeah. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and then, and yeah, then that's where you have a problem when it comes to output legitimacy. I like the term, I get what it is, but you cannot have output legitimacy when the council stalls the process. Because at a certain point, look at migration and asylum, there is no output anymore. No. No. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. And we have about uh, 15, 20 minutes, so if we want to actually collect uh, questions from the audience, I think I should ask you a very quick question. Sorry. Okay, let's do that. Let's go on with questions from the audience because I saw all of a sudden like many hands raising, so we can uh, discuss further afterwards. How much time did you say we have? How much time did you say About we have? 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Okay. Oh. Yeah. If you have a question, please raise your hand first. I will so come to you here. with okay. the microphone so people at home watching the live stream can actually hear you. Please remember if you have a question, to end it with a question mark as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, Thank you. W would I have like five minutes of course to you answer will. Yeah, of course. Uh, some yeah. of the things? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> first, do you want to do that first? Do you want to do that first? No, no, no that's I fine, right? I don't want to cut okay. the, the discussion. Yes, okay. Or, or yeah, good evening. My name is Landman. I'm from the European okay, uh, Language Rights Foundation. Right. And we made a referendum against the Ukraine uh, uh, agreement. Do you have a question right yeah. now to yeah. one of these people? Yeah. Yeah. Regarding the uh, legitimacy of the European Union and the rule of law, basically uh, Europe just uh, uh, wrote this association agreement mm -hmm. and there's no rule of law in the Ukraine and not in Romania as well, where there's uh, ethnic oppression going on. And we have a lot of uh, uh, things with the European Court. And um, what is the question you would like to ask either of these? European is, uh, European Union is not working, and uh, the European Union is not capable of defending its own core values. And Mrs. Sargentini is picking out Hungary, for example, but she's not doing anything with uh, Romania. <clears throat> and I think that the European Union has a credibility problem. Okay, so basically we're asking once again about the democratic... Uh, maybe you should collect a couple yes. of questions. Maybe, yeah, maybe if, you should have a few more I questions. just wanted uh, Etienne to answer, but sure. Yes, one there, please. 
Not too fast, please. Yeah, My uh, ears uh, the, are very bad. The term interregnum yes. was used by you, and I'd like to give a little impetus to that. Yes. Could it be that much of the present disorientation and uncertainty is due to the fact that we are moving from an organization of democratic states in the European Union, which we all know how that functions, to a new kind of transnational democracy, which we still have to discover. And that we are not in that process muddling on, but falling down and standing up in order to, to make that change over from organization of democratic states to transnational democracy. Any other question for now? Yes, then. there and then there, and then I think we should collect the answers. Yeah, what's our, the moral obligation of Europe towards the former colonies of the European countries? Ah. The former colonies? Yeah, oh. like, like uh, the Antilles. Like, yes. like uh, the colonies of yes. France, of England, yes. of Belgium. Yeah, yes. okay. Yes. Yes, I take that. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, a recent, uh, uh, quite uh, rigorous methodologically um, study from the University of Amsterdam shows that 65% of the population across Europe asked uh, is in favor of a European global uh, social welfare system. Social this, what? welfare. Yeah, welfare. Uh, welfare. Uh, uh, social welfare. Europe, but yeah, yeah, in yes, terms yes. of contributing, to, so we have a common welfare system. I find it really interesting and quite disturbing that I keep hearing that this is not happening in the name of that people don't actually want it. Okay. It's just yeah. untrue, not to say yeah. a lie. Yeah. So yeah. I wonder why this lie keeps on being proliferated. What kind of thing does okay. it Okay. Yeah. Okay, so there is a political will, yeah. it's just not being listened to. I would ask Etienne to give us a feedback yes. about, like, and on then, their feedbacks, and, and then, then, then we have transnational democracy, yeah. colonies, uh, common European welfare state and the lack of democratization in certain yes, areas. Yes, yes, yes. Well, since uh, <laughs> I've been speaking so long, now we have little time. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me, I should have spared you, spared you the Jewish Soviet joke. I, 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 uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, well, the colonies, I'd like to see. Uh, um, there, there are at least two questions, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, perhaps more, uh, which deal with the issue of democracy. And uh, uh, I, I completely agree with the idea that uh, we find ourselves in a historical moment in which certain forms of democracy call for transformation, renewal, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, innovation. Uh, I, um, I mean, the great German philosopher, uh, liberal philosopher Jürgen Habermas, made that point again and again, and this is a, a point on which I agree with him, that uh, um, uh, the importance of the uh, European construction as such could not be separated from the general uh, uh, issue of the progress or development of democracy in the world. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, I would not uh, 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 say that uh, Europe has any birthright privilege in this, in this respect, but I do believe that it has to play a role in uh, uh, solving or helping to solve this problem. Uh, the idea of illiberal democracy, of course, is a grotesque uh, contradiction in terms, but it's really the symptom of the fact that certain forms are not uh, uh, completely or no longer really uh, uh, working and s that some other forms are required. Uh, on this uh, uh, issue, uh, I'm not the kind of uh, 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 radical... Uh, 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 destructor of institutions that you <laughs> seem to 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 to, to believe. I want to provoke I'm, 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 <laughs> Yes, I know, I know. This is, uh, uh, for example, as much as I 
uh, a belief coming from France in this moment, uh, of course, that uh, the call for more direct forms of uh, democracy or more participative forms of democracy is, is an essential uh, um, demand and, and request of our, of our times, which also means that democracy cannot be uh, uh, built from uh, uh, above or, or above or uh, 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 offered is, to the people part of and, that and must also come from bottom, yes? Is please? part of that not also because you come from France, where the Very national so. parliament you is rather I weak? I completely agree with you. I also, you. because you said I speak as a European, not yes. as a citizen from no, France. No, no, not. And I yes. don't think you yeah. could separate it that okay. well. Okay, huh? okay, okay. Okay, I, I take your point, uh, together with what uh, 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 Professor uh, uh, Brunkhorst was uh, saying uh, uh, a moment ago about the proposals of our, of our, of our president, which I, I find, uh, uh, in a sense, very nice and more than acceptable and useful uh, 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 if you take them literally. Yes. But then you turn to what he's doing in his own country and you ask the question whether there's not a, an enormous uh, yes. problem of credibility yes. with somebody who says we need a, a, a social Europe and at the same time, in fact, shows that his way of... Uh, 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 dealing the social economic situation in 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 in, in, in France is completely opposed to to, yes. to 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 that. So so I would uh, 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 conclude on this point, and I'm, again I'm too long, uh, uh, by uh, um, uh, uh, just um, uh, by just uh, saying that I uh, do believe in the import. I repeat that I believe in the importance of uh, enhancing and developing representative democracy at levels where it is not sufficiently uh, uh, powerful or, or efficient. And at, at the same time, I think that other forms of, uh, of or other dimensions or aspects of, of democracy are very uh, uh, strongly needed if we want this uh, 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 enhancement of representation to actually take place. Uh, I take a final example on that. The European Parliament, of which you are a member, has done something in the last uh, days, in fact, or, or, or weeks, which some French citizens like myself found, of course, very important at the moral and symbolic uh, uh, level. They issued not a a decision, but a warning against the form in which the French police forcing forces are handling public demonstrations uh, uh, in France. Yes. The use of certain weapons and uh, and and certain uh, uh, justifications for that. So maybe this is not exactly as bad as uh, 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 transforming constitutional changes in Poland or uh, 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 the situation we have in Hungary, but it shows that problems with the uh, concrete uh, uh, realization and effectiveness, I would say, of certain basic civil and democratic uh, rights exist or can exist anywhere in, in, in Europe. And I take the example of, uh, uh, I could take the example of, of, of Italy also, uh, of course, I don't know about this uh, country. So this calls, I, I, I think, for a construction of uh, democracy that is both national and trans national that both involves representative dimensions and elements of uh, participation and more uh, uh, direct democracy and uh, uh, we must find the combination of, uh, of all uh, that now finally on the question of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the former colonies of Europe I the moral obligation I um, of course, it's a moral obligation. I admit that, and coming from France, uh, if I denied that, I, I, I would uh, uh, be. A, uh, it would be a shame, you know. So that must have concrete. Uh, uh, that must have concrete uh, um, uh, applications and, 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 and consequences. Again, I'm not here to speak about my own government or my own president. Yeah? But there is a problem of credibility. When you read, we need to create a new relationship with Africa, 
And I believe that this is also f extremely important in the world global situation that uh, Professor Bronkos was uh, describing, because in the current world situation, on the one side you have Trump who doesn't, and, and America who has no program for the, the third world and the South. On the other side you have China, which I don't want to transform into a monster, but which has a, a hegemonic uh, 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 program with respect to uh, uh, the South. And particularly uh, Africa. So the question inevitably becomes what kind of program of cooperation with the South does Europe have? But this cannot be separated from the fact that these are our former colonies, and particularly in the case of uh, uh, France, because the corruption exists more than ever, because the armed intervention, sometimes inevitable perhaps, but most of the time also in the service of certain very uh, uh, concrete private uh, and and, and national interest continue more uh, uh, than ever. And because uh, 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 finally, the kind of, uh, uh, I wouldn't say merging, but very uh, 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 strong uh, um, uh, cooperation and, uh, and, 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 and alliance between the peoples themselves, which rely on politics of, vi of visas, migrations, education, rights, uh, uh, possibilities for students from, from, from Africa to study in Europe, and perhaps conversely even, uh, all that should be much more explicitly and yes, morally and, 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 and politically asserted. Thank you, mm. thanks a lot. You wanted to say something on colonies as we brought yeah. in also yeah. France, if you want to yeah. uh, spend any word yeah. on... Yeah. Well, let me, I, I'd like to say something about this issue about colonies. Uh, I agree very much with... Ex-colonies. Ex-colonies. <laughs> uh, I agree very much with, with our colleague Maliba. Uh, curiously enough, the Dutch have taken the totally opposite position from the French. France, think in geopolitical terms, has in a sense created a structure in Africa, by and large, the Dutch have always wanted to get rid as quickly as possible of their former colonies with terrible consequences. We have destroyed our relationship with Indonesia. Uh, in Suriname, and I was minister, uh, we bought two uh, parliamentarians to uh, have very rapid, uh, uh, rapid, rapid independence. And what we now see, for instance, in uh, uh, the Antilles with the crisis in Venezuela, uh, we say, well, this is basically your problem. Uh, we are willing to help you a little bit, but it is your problem. Uh, so uh, my view has always been uh, that uh, the possibility for these territories to become what is called ultra peripheric regions of the European Union would be the best, because it gives you a kind of independence like Madeira, like the Spanish Canary Islands, like the Azores, uh, but there is still a feeling European law applies and the development of this moral dimension, which we talked about earl earlier, uh, can replace sometimes the corruption and the fact of being too small to really have a structure which is useful. Uh, do you mind if I say just one thing about the operationality for the coming time? Because Please. we agree uh, that we are in a very dangerous situation. Uh, and I would like to take the migration issue, uh, and also referring to uh, the report of President Macron, as an example where we could we could restore some kind of moral quality, because I liked very much what you said on that point. Uh, Europe has lost a lot of credibility on the moral issue of migration. I think we agree here, probably. But at the same time, I do not think that the current European Union, with 27, even taking the British out, can resolve that issue. Uh, the, 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 the cleavage between, in that sense, Poland, Hungary, and a few others, and the West is such. So we are forced to resolve it in a smaller framework. Uh, and for the first time, I would plead very openly for looking uh, at a new kind of Schengen, which was proposed by Mr. Macron, based on the one hand on discipline uh, and on the other hand on solidarity. Uh, and I think if we cannot get a common asylum system, including the decisions needed to implement that, and at the same time border, which are outside, uh, in the shorter framework, we will not succeed anything else because this is the biggest issue where a lot of Europeans feel against the European Union as impotent. So uh, my strong view is that 
combining values, as Macron said, and borders, it can only be done in a smaller framework. He didn't say it in so many words, but I think it should be done. Mm -hmm. Of course. You Please. You mind picking up um, uh, Jaap Hoeksma's point on transnational democracies, uh, one of your favorite topics. Yes. Um, I think indeed we're not, we're, we're not there yet and we're actually struggling to get ahead around it. Um, if I look at the debate now, for instance, in this country on what to do with citizen, British citizens when we've got a harsh Brexit, when we're not coming to a proper deal, will you then allow these citizens, for instance, to keep dual citizenship, which the Netherlands does not allow at the moment. If we ca you can between European member states, but if you want the Dutch nationality and you hold the nationality of a third country, which is what the UK will be uh, pretty soon, then you're supposed to give up your nationality of that third country. We're not there mentally, I would say, when it comes to transnational democracies, because in a globalizing world, and I'm not embracing globalization uh, in, its, in its economic ways, but in a globalizing world uh, where uh, a, a room like this is becoming more and more multi-ethnic, uh, where you hear more and more different languages on the streets in Amsterdam, the whole idea that you can still hold on to one identity or one nationality is, is a lost case. And if we continue to do that, and it's not only the Netherlands that does that, uh, and it actually helps if you simplify it. I think it helps the extreme right or the populist right by suggesting that you've got one identity and your nationality and your identity are one and the same. If we continue to do that, we're creating more and more people that fall yeah. beneath between yeah. the, the gaps because they simply don't fit the bill. And we're walking away from that understanding of a transnational democracy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Which, which allows me to pick up on the point of is there a willingness in Europe to create, and indeed Macron wrote something in his letter about it as well, a European so a social welfare system. I would ap appreciate that a lot in all its difficulties, and I think it's way too difficult to talk about how that should look, but if mm. we're moving away instead of forward in this understanding of what is transnational democracy, we're most definitely not going to go there. And if I look how horrible, difficult the debate has been on the, um, on the, um, uh, uh, what's the word in English again? The data sharing richtlijn. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? the, the detachment director. Posting of yeah. workers. Um, on th what to do with Central European um, employees working in Western Europe, exactly. where you would think that the case that Western Europe is making, which is equal pay for equal work, is embraced by everybody, but it's simply not true because Central European governments say, if we do that, we will not have the chance to send our citizens working your countries anymore. So we oppose equal work uh, equal pay for equal work. Um, okay, I'm only throwing an extra problem on the no, table, no, no, no. but it no. shows... This is one that had been yeah. left aside, and it's very yeah. important. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, Etienne, I would like you to yeah, say something about this. No, I, I would react very, very quickly uh, yeah. uh, on uh, uh, one uh, 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 point. Um, if you look at what... Uh, what President Macron uh, uh, writes this on the this issue was of my borders... Question. Also on the Renaissance, yeah, yeah. the Second you see, Renaissance. No, no, the Second Renaissance is... A yes, yeah. that's, yeah. that's uh, Flowery. the French yeah. kings. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> love Renaissance. But uh, yeah. uh, um, yeah. it's, uh, it's, uh, it's heavily bent in the direction of security and protection. Mm -hmm. And not at all... Uh, 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 suggesting that uh, exchanges, uh, both of uh, cultural forms and people, uh, 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 could be a resource for that uh, 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 renaissance of uh, uh, Europe. So mm -hmm. you have the titles are extremely telling. 
uh, a section is called defending, defendre notre liberté, defending our freedoms or our, or our freedom. That's our freedom as European, but not the freedom of others uh, uh, who, in fact, have become increasingly our uh, 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 neighbors and partners in all sorts of uh, uh, cultural and economic exchanges. So there's nothing about the rights of the migrants themselves. And then you have protect our continent. Mm. Uh, so that's heavily bent, I believe, in the, in the, in the direction of a repressive uh, understanding mm -hmm. of borders. I don't say there are no problems of security. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not stupid. But, but what, uh, to create a European Council of Security means yeah. that, in fact, we want a more centrally and more uh, powerfully equipped police force in, 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 in Europe. And only that. Well, please. Uh, well, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, and I think dangers of that always exist. But if you want to create a common system of asylum uh, with common rules for who is going to come in and who's coming out, you must combine it, of course, with the security dimension at the outside. Uh, the way it is then formulated, we can agree or disagree on. But I think the basic idea that within Europe we finally come to grips with the migration issue is very fundamental because the populists, both on the right and on the left, curiously mm -hmm. enough, combine against Europe mm -hmm. and want to go back to the nation state. And we know that the nation state has no solution for that issue at all. Mm -hmm. So without becoming too theoretical, it is becoming the question, can European sovereignty be combined with national sovereignty? But, let's not, not place. but let's, uh, let me be practical and not theoretical at all. I've seen the out, outside borders of the European Union on various places, and they are very strong. And the issue is not that we don't protect our borders good enough. Our borders are heavily protected. Yes. The issue is that people need a way in yeah. that we're not providing otherwise than just go on a boat and yeah. give it a yeah. try, survival yeah. of the fittest. We could actually protect our borders a lot better if we would give people the paperwork yeah. to use the normal crossing. Yeah. But that's the second of part of it. It's not only protecting the border, it's also the other thing. I agree that. But you cannot do it one without the other. And it is, yeah. I think it is the extreme right that is banking on unclear messages by prime ministers that know this, that saw the numbers going down that are arriving in Europe, but still are not willing sure, to sure. do that because <laughs> it is simply too attractive yeah. Yeah. to continue to suggest we have a migration yeah. crisis, we which agree. we don't have. No, we, agree. we agree, we agree. But... I'm not here we, for the no. applause. No, 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 but I mean, b before we, we get misunderstanding, yeah. we agree on that point, Good. I think, fundamentally. But at the same time, we should change, for instance, the Dublin regulation. Yes. And that is a very fundamental point. I mean, the point European Parliament definitely tried to do sure, it and achieved sure. that but goal. But the member states are willing. Then, <laughs> it's a political will. No, it's happens. a political yeah. will. Yeah. Sure. It's no, non-existing. Yeah. We're ready for every piece of legislation yeah. to negotiate yeah. it. Yeah. In fact, I took upon me yeah. the returns directive, which is the nastiest part. It is letting, making sure that people leave and they're not allowed to yeah. stay. And the member states are willing to talk about that piece of legislation, the returns directive, but not could, the other bits. Could you bits. comment on the difference between the European Parliament and the national parliaments? I mean, I've seen the both sides, and I believe that fundamentally there is a cleavage growing between the two, that within the same party, uh, maybe it's not yes. with the Greens and with D66, but with a lot of others, there is a lot of hesitation on the national side, and the European parliamentarians are more positive. Yes, I would say even in your and my party. But I do see a huge difference between the Netherlands, where, as you, your examples were right, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm playing around with old ministers from different countries in the European Parliament all the time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I saw a colleague leave with whom I negotiated the money laundering legislation, who is now the prime minister of Latvia. So, mm -hmm. But the Netherlands, we seem to not be able to bring forward right. uh, um, seasoned uh, politicians to the European Parliament. And I think there's, the a lack whole of interest in yes, there's a whole different understanding and interest, I would say, in, uh, in, in countries in Central Europe and in Southern yeah. Europe. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. We have time for one last question. If there is one. Oh, Otherwise, I have one there. Please, thank you. For statement. 
No question um, mark. I was wondering um, if we could return a little bit to some of your Marxist roots, because I think that one of the things that I've been lacking a little bit is some criticism of uh, corporate interests in Europe, which have been very fundamental in shaping the way that Europe works and how the institutions uh, have been set up as well. So what would you say about, about those interests? How are they today also influencing the, the, shape, the shape of Europe? Who is Just you? pretend then I have a one last... I think Who it's you, definitely you about is, you. you. It's your so Marx. It's, it's that, your that is, Marx. It's that is your yeah. Marx. Yes, we didn't talk about yeah. it. <laughs> then I have a final are, question. Well, I will simply say done. that, uh, of course, uh, uh, <laughs> lobbies uh, 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 um, at the European Commission, etc., are uh, 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 quasi-official uh, in, in, in a sense, and uh, they probably do exist as well... Uh, uh, with regard to the European Parliament. So, so I would welcome a Marxist uh, uh, complete description, uh, sociological and financial, uh, of the uh, uh, um, uh, magnitude and, and, and forms of this, uh, uh, of this influence. But that is not, uh, uh, that is not, uh, uh, that is one half of the problem, I would say. There's no governance in today's world that is that is not playing with economic interests that are also corporate interests, huh? and therefore we get to a, a, a more general question, which is what kind of regulations, not only nationally but uh, continentally and finally globally, uh, do we think are necessary to somehow curb this? power which is totally uh, 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 one-sided and, and has absolutely no democratic uh, 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 counterpart. And certainly this is one uh, 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 space or one uh, uh, um, realm in, uh, wish I, in which I, I would wish that the European Union has a leading uh, uh, role and not only a passive, uh, uh, ordinary, uh, uh, neoliberal uh, 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 attitude. The, the, the American Congress, uh, apparently, is sometimes more <laughs> uh, uh, radical in trying to elucidate this kind of ties than, than, than the European institutions them, uh, themselves, yeah. which is an yeah. interesting uh, 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 example. But again, I would uh, probably uh, want to, and I stop with that, bring back what uh, Representative Sargentini was uh, uh, saying a moment ago. What is lacking, perhaps, are not so much the institutions than the moral and okay, and, well, and yeah. political yeah. Uh, uh, will. will. And that takes us back, of course, to the question of uh, 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 what uh, the citizens in, 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 in Europe that was exactly want, my last what, question. what they do, and how they uh, uh, um, uh, organize, in quote unquote, uh, uh, themselves to have their voices heard, not only nationally, but also trans transnationally. Uh, reason why, as little and, uh, and modest, uh, uh, the idea, your idea of uh, Agora Europe can sound, and there are equivalents in other places, it's something very precious in my eyes. Thank you, thanks. I have a very last question. I would just like a short comment uh, from all of you. So we talk about the Treaty of Lisbon, we mentioned the Treaty of Maastricht, yeah and this idea of European citizenship. And I think what stems from today, from the, tonight's uh, event, is this idea of like bringing together somehow national democracy and transnational democracy mm -hmm. on the one hand. And as you mentioned many times in some of your essays, this idea of bringing or adding, this was the word you used, yeah. uh, moments or passages of participatory democracy within the representative system, whether that's possible or not. This is what we tr were trying to do with Charter 2020. And I have to remind that uh, Rui Tavares is not actually only a professor of philosophy, he's also a former uh, MEP in the Green Party. Um, so my question is, when we talk about we the people of Europe, as you did, uh, who are we talking about? There what was a question want? mark, there was a question mark. I know. Yeah. Yeah. When you talk about we, the people of Europe, what are we talking about? What do they want? How can we uh, somehow give them voice mm -hmm. and listen to them? So uh, you did first and then yeah. uh, Brinkhurst and then uh, Etienne Bolivar. Thank you. I, I, that, that is kind of a difficult question for a member of parliament because I do believe in representation, a democracy 
through representation. And uh, I, I look at uh, youngsters in Great Britain that didn't go voting for the referendum and that are very sorry they didn't go and mm -hmm. cast their vote. So I think that, re that, that, that being heard is also taking responsibility to be heard and actually cast your vote and then hold your representative uh, responsible for their acts during, during, the, during the years. And I was a member of city council here and I've seen a lot of, uh, before my time in the European Parliament, and I've seen a lot of experiments of trying to get people involved in politics mm -hmm. and I'm embracing them all. But you, you always have similar sort of people on the table, the ones that like this anyway. <coughs> so I don't, you're, you're not, I'm not the right girl for creative <laughs> solutions when it comes to hear, having people's voice heard. It's simply not my forte. Because you're a voice. That's exactly. The <laughs> a representative is their voice. Yeah. Yes, well. but that would suggest that I don't want other voices heard, which is no, not no, the no, case. No, no. Nobody <laughs> believes that. No. Okay. No. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I, I have always believed strongly that we can only get the bottom-up democracy in Europe if we are creating transnational parties. Uh, sure. uh, there is a first beginning now. Yep. There's an organization called Volt. Uh, young people, I, I personally do not believe that they will have a lot of success, but I think it's a beginning. But what I was surprised at is that in the European Parliament, a vote on having at least a share of transnational parties uh, in the European elections was rejected. Yes, by, uh, that, by the right side of the that's Parliament. That's right, sure, whoever yeah. it was. But that shows that the national democracies are still, to a certain extent, preventing a Europeanization. Uh, I've been both in the national parliament and in the European parliament and loved at the, at the European level and at the national level in government. I strongly believe that the, the biggest blockage for development is that within the national parliament, you're in a sense being paid to be very critical about what happens in Europe. And I take the pulse fishing as, a, as another example. Pulse fishing uh, was, was uh, allowed in the Netherlands for 5%. We then gave, gave uh, possibilities for about 80%. So the whole fishing fleet in the Netherlands is now pulse fishing. Of course, in the European framework, framework there was a resistance, partly with national reasons in France, for instance. But I think more fundamentally is that we totally neglected in the Dutch situation the European regulations. Mm -hmm. But in the Dutch Parliament, uh, you must be very courageous to say we should believe that the European solution is the correct one. They all say this is an example that Europe is not serving us. And I think as long as that situation prevails, the political will of moving in the direction of a more European approach is getting very res reserved. So I'm, on the one hand, very enthusiastic about the need to move forward. And I think we must move forward. But the chances that we really will come up with new solutions uh, are, are depending very much on what the lady there said. If 57% of the people would like to have a social welfare system at the European level, the national developments is against that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thanks, Etienne. Yeah, I think you you put us on <laughs> sorry for on the stance uh, yeah. on the on the right track. I mean, to what you say about transnational parties, I would gladly add transnational movements, yeah. transnational mm -hmm. campaigns. Yeah. Uh, I very much like the uh, there's a famous. Uh, uh, essay by uh, the American political philosopher Richard Rorty where he develops this uh, symmetry of movements and campaigns. Huh? So I, uh, sometimes you don't know where to locate things. Is, uh, is, is, is feminism a movement? Is, the, is, it a, is it a campaign? What, what is taking place tomorrow? Will, the, will these be, uh, these will be trans-European and in fact global demonstrations for the rights of women? They are somewhere across this uh, uh, divide. But it seems to me that the historical uh, experience uh, from 
the end of the 18th century onwards, and etc., did prove that representative democracy was itself more democratic and more efficient when it was not just a juridical frame, uh, frame but also something that uh, uh, had connections with campaigns and with uh, 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 movements. Now, if the youngsters in, 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 in Britain no longer vote, there are many reasons for that, but some of the reasons, uh, and although Britain is not the worst case in Europe from this point of view, but have to do, of course, with the decline uh, of uh, the labor movement, uh, the trade unions, and other forms of, uh, of, uh, of popular, I would say, uh, associations. So that belongs perhaps to, to the past, but we need the equivalent if we want this democracy to be uh, uh, strong. Now, of course, the experience also shows that the, m the higher you, you, you raise, so to speak, in the uh, scale uh, of, uh, in the scales of power and governments, the more difficult, difficult it becomes to connect in a lively manner, campaigns, movement, grassroots, uh, uh, militant experiences, and so on, and the, the, the working of, uh, of, of, of the representative institutions themselves. I completely agree with that, but we must try and, and get as high as we can. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are other obstacles there, one of which uh, uh, clearly is the language obstacle that takes us to the... Uh, but it also, it's also not necessarily the case that people from different countries who don't have, uh, uh, I'd say, high school level or, or academic education are not able to communicate uh, 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 with one uh, another. The need creates the capacity in many, in, uh, to, to, to some extent. I, I always remember a, a Wittgensteinian formula that Zygmunt Bauman was uh, uh, using on this question, how to translate experiences from one language or, or uh, to, to another, when you do not master the uh, uh, language, you pretend, you pretend, you <laughs> and, and, you, and you find. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Etienne Bolivar, and thank you all. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much. It's over. It's over. It's over.